I've been thrilled with the path I've gone down. I've gotten to do all sorts of really great things and go all over the world. Created a test that could honestly change the dynamic of how dogs are bred in the future, which is a little bit mind boggling to me, but it's not where I anticipated going originally. So that's the other thing I would say is, is be open, be ready for whatever comes your way because you don't know when it's gonna come and you need to be ready to grab it and, and go with it because it could be quite honestly life-changing and, and could be better than what you had originally planned out in your mind anyway. Wikipedia defines genetics as the study of genes, genetic variation, and heredity in organisms. Veterinary genetics is quite the rare specialty, and I have one of those rare experts for you today, Dr. Angela Hughes. She has led quite a few advancements in companion animal genetics, especially with her work with Wisdom Health, a company under Mars. While she is currently focused as a scientific communications specialist at Royal Canin, even in her personal time, her fascination with breed genetics can be seen in her COVID puppy, a Welsh Springer Spaniel, Nori. Yet, it was something very different that first sparked her interest in veterinary medicine, and here she is to tell. When did you first know you wanted to even get into veterinary medicine? Oh, um, well, I, I originally, and actually just last weekend, we went to a um, museum exhibit about James Cameron, the uh, director uh, who did Titanic and, and all that sort of thing. But he did a movie called The Abyss back in the, I think, late 80s, early 90s. That movie, I still, I was telling my husband because this, this um, museum exhibit showed lots of the stuff they had to invent because they literally filmed most of this underwater. I just remember sitting there watching that movie and having a huge impact on me. I was uh, probably 13, 14, something like that. And I was just completely infatuated and was like, all right, I'm gonna go be a marine engineer. I wanna build the submersibles and get to the bottom of the ocean. And, you know, fast forward a few years, I'm in, you know, I was a freshman in college. I was doing physics. I was doing, you know, in a marine engineer, well, I was in an engineering physics combo program. And I had this realization after spending the summer working with horses at the summer camp I'd been going to since I was six, um, that, I wanted to go to the bottom of the ocean, not to build the submersible to get there, but to see what was there. And that's when I had a bit of a, a mental shift of physics and engineering was really not my happy place. Um, my happy place was more in with the animals and, and working with them directly. I also had a background of my father's an OBGYN and I had worked in his practice when I was a kid doing paperwork and that sort of thing, but I got to experience what it's like to deal with insurances and patients and all of that sort of thing. And so I always joke, uh, I, A, I didn't have to deal with insurances and B, I could kiss my patients. So, <laughs> so, um, and not get in trouble. Um, but anyway, so yeah, I went into, I decided at that point I wanted to be a veterinarian. And so I went back my sophomore year and switched majors. Thankfully, everything I had taken as a physics major now applied to uh, to my eventual biochemistry and molecular biology major. And I was not a, a junior taking physics and dreading it because I already had that done. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I took a little bit of a circuitous route and didn't realize, you know, I wasn't the six-year-old that was like, oh, I'm going to be a veterinarian. I was the, you know, 19-year-old that said, oh, hey, I'm going to go be a veterinarian. But I always knew I wasn't really cut out for general practice. Uh, in undergrad, um, as part of my graduation program, I had to do a thesis and I ended up doing it in genetics. And then I worked for a year at Roche Molecular Systems, which is a subsidiary of Hoffman LaRoche, essentially constructing uh, DNA tests for humans. So I did some stuff around uh, some genes related to HIV and AIDS transmission. I looked at telomerase activity in urine samples to try to diagnose bladder cancers in humans and things like that. So that's what I went into veterinary school with, uh, was having that genetics background and kind of had the realization of, hey, animals have DNA. <laughs> I, can, I can go in that, in that route. So that's kind of how I, I ended up, you know, navigating my way. I really wanted to work on endangered species, uh, but, you know, being a zoo vet is 
a very difficult road to go down, uh, and especially if you want to get paid and eat. Um, so, so I, uh, I was like, well, I'll be the geneticist that tells them which pandas to breed together. Anyway, ended up doing a residency at UC Davis uh, under Danica Banish and working a lot with Autumn Davidson on the reproductive service. So did a lot of uh, theory or repro work as well. Because I could get funding to look at DNA in dogs, that's where I ended up. Uh, but it kind of was fortuitous and worked out. And I went into dog and, and cat to some degree and a little bit of horse, but primarily dog genetics research and, and then wound up at Mars doing dog genetics. So did you ever get to work with pandas or? Maybe Not like directly. <laughs> um, however, Autumn Davidson was uh, consulting with the National Zoo when they did a TCI, a transcervical insemination, on one of their pandas back in like 2005, maybe? that time frame, and I happened to be in the room while she was on the phone explaining to them because pandas have a very narrow window for uh, fertility. So you got like a 24 hour time frame to impregnate her this year. <laughs> so your next opportunity is a year from now. So it was very critical. She came in to heat a little bit earlier than they anticipated. So Autumn had to walk them through, you know, how to do a TCI on a, on a panda over the phone. And I still remember sitting in the room um, in, the, in uh, the UC Davis hospital while she was doing that. And then a couple of years later, when I went to Mars uh, for the interview, uh, their uh, offices where I did the interview was outside of Washington, D.C. And so I spent some time at the National Zoo and saw the panda that was produced from the, uh, the TCI oh. event. <laughs> yes. So that was, that was a little full circle, but no, I have not personally done it. That, that's still really neat. And it's never too late, but it also highlights really the value of being a consultant and you can still do a lot over the phone. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Absolutely. That's really cool. And so you brought us to Mars. Also with wisdom, you really led a lot of different projects. So do you mind sharing a little bit of the experience working with this type of you know, opportunity for a career? Yeah. So when I started, they had just done the soft launch for the wisdom panel uh, into veterinary practices. And it was a blood sample. It was a little bit complicated, obviously, and a little bit outside the normal mode of operation for the average veterinary practice. So we had to, A, do a lot of education, and then B, we quickly learned uh, and, and decided to pivot a bit a few years later into a more of a direct-to-consumer um, product with a swab test. Uh, was definitely involved in, in making that pivot from a blood-based test to a, a swab-based test. Uh, and then I also uh, was prompted um, by a Mars family member to look at what we could do to help the purebred dogs. We had gathered all of this information about purebred dogs in order to figure out what the mixed breed dog was composed of, uh, but how can we leverage that information to help purebred dogs as well? Um, and I said, well, you know, I have this philosophy of purebred dogs being like endangered species. You know, their genetic diversity is fairly small within any given breed. I mean, it's vast across all of the dog breeds, but within any of the 400 or so recognized dog breeds in the world, it's, it's a lot narrower genetic pool. So how do we work to maximize the health of that population within a breed by, by maximizing the genetic diversity? Because we do know uh, that a lot of conditions are genetically related, so, you know, but we don't yet have a genetic test for them. Hip dysplasia is a, is a key one where there's a number of genes involved but we don't have you know, a test yet that can go in and diagnose, okay, you have this and this and this gene. And if you went and bred to that dog, you'd you know, produce puppies that had hip dysplasia 90% of the time or whatever. We don't have that yet. So my idea was if we can you know, work to, to maximize uh, the genetic diversity within a small population, we can increase the health of the breed. Also, as breeds get kind of more and more limited in their gene pool, get more and more inbred, they tend to have reproductive issues. So lower levels of uh, number of puppies per litter and that sort of thing. Fecundity tends to go down. 
uh, and we've seen that across a number of species. Uh, we've also seen implications in the health of the semen. Uh, so the, the semen motility and, and morphology and such like that tends to decline as the male is more and more inbred. So needless to say, I, I took this information and said, okay, how can we leverage the genetic data we have to work within a breed to maximize the genetic diversity and developed what was at the time a first of its kind genetic diversity test for breeding dogs, essentially. So you could genetically map you know, a female and a couple of different males and then say, okay, which of these males would be most appropriate uh, for the genetic diversity com um, composition. And I worked with a very keen breeder, Miriam Couteau, in the Dandy Dinmont Terrier Club, who uh, was here in Washington State. And uh, she kept meticulous records on the breed. There was only about 42 Dandy Dinmont Terriers produced per year and registered with the AKC. So an extremely small population. On average, at the time, they're getting roughly just over two puppies per litter on average. When we incorporated uh, genetic diversity into their mating decisions uh, and looking at that com component as well, we were seeing over six puppies per litter um, on a regular basis. So they, they were seeing litter sizes they hadn't seen in, in quite some time. And so that was really fabulous because again, that's, that's an easy way to, to uh, analyze if what we were doing was working uh, on, a, on a very short-term scale. Obviously longer term, hopefully, Keep the, keep the genetic diversity from, from declining and, and bottlenecking uh, and keep it healthier by looking at that combination. So, so anyway, that kind of sparked a, a bit of a revolution within uh, the dog breeding community. And so now there's a number of tests on the market that, that do something similar. And I just encourage breeders to really think about genetic diversity when they're, when they're making their breeding decisions as well. So how aware do you feel people are about those tests? Within the breeding community, uh, you know, obviously when we first introduced it in like 2011, 2012, this was a, a very unusual concept and, and it wasn't always super well taken. Interestingly enough, the cat breeders, when, it, when we introduced it to them probably five or seven, eight years later, they were very keen on it because they have a different philosophy. Cat breeds oftentimes are really based on, you know, kind of one mutation different. Your Himalayan is a Persian, but with the pointed gene. Your exotic is a Persian, but with the short hair gene. You know, so they're, they kind of take a one-off approach, but that means that they have a very, very limited gene pool and they know that. So they are much more willing to outcross to another breed. And that's pretty common in, in cat breeding. Or I think for those reasons, they tend to approach it a little bit more aware of genetic diversity and genetic bottlenecks and maybe are less precious about, you know, maintaining the, the purity of their, of their population because otherwise they wouldn't have any cats. They just literally wouldn't reproduce because they wouldn't have any genetic diversity. Uh, whereas dog breeders, you know, have had the benefit of a lot more genetic diversity and, and a lot longer history. So cat breeding really is you know, primarily in the last hmm, 60, 70 years that we've had a lot of cat breeds developed. But dog breeding has been pretty popular for a few hundred years for all of these different breeds. Most are, you know, 100, 200 years old. Victorian England really made a, an increase in the number of different dog breeds. They are, I think, a little bit more precious about this is my purebred, you know, population and I'm not going to do any kind of outcrosses and line breeding is, is much more common in that, in that scenario. So I think it took a little bit more convincing and education on the part of the dog breeders. That said, I'm not really a part of the wisdom health team anymore. So I'm not on it uh, day to day, but in my own personal life, I now have a Welsh Springer Spaniel whom I'm hoping to uh, finish her championship and, and then eventually breed her. And so I'm hearing from from breeders that are using genetic testing. Right now, I think they're probably more fixated on the genetic health mutations. So for you know specific mutations for certain diseases, but I, I see them embracing it, I think a lot more readily than what I saw a decade ago, which is very exciting. 
Yes. You are just showing why Dr. Kessler recommended that I bring you on the podcast, which by the way, you were already on my list, but you, you got a second, <laughs> second vote. vote. <laughs> I find this fascinating. I, I love listening to Dr. Kessler and his experience with breeders because I, you know, the, my question was how wide awareness do you feel is around these tests? And you answered with breeders what about the veterinary community? Because I think there's a disconnect between the veterinary professional and the breeding community. So what are your observations with that? And, it, and you can address it about the, the specific test, but mm -hmm. also in a, in a broader sense. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, genetics is an area that, in my opinion, hasn't gotten a lot of love. Um, we can We could spend a whole several podcasts talking about, you know, veterinary education and the curriculum and, and all of that sort of thing. And, you know, we want more nutrition education and, and all of that sort of thing. And we all just want more education on our topics because it's all so interesting and fascinating and we think it could save the world. That said, there's a limited amount of time of what people can get in terms of uh, education before vet school or during vet school. I think that uh, genetics doesn't get a ton of love. So I think it's a little bit of a black box for a lot of veterinarians. And while I think most people, if you sit down and you can explain it to them, you know, and I've always taken the approach of kind of the, the mechanism or the pathophysiology behind something. And I think once you explain it in that sort of language, most people can get it, even the lay audience. That said, they're drinking from a fire hose and trying to keep track of so many different things and that sort of thing. So, so I think genetics might not meet the, you know, the top of their list. So we need to work as a, you know, industry, the genetics industry, essentially, to help them with the tools uh, to incorporate this information readily um, and, and appropriately. So that's that's one of the big controversies that we've kind of faced in genetics is how, what kind of information can we interpret from any given genetic result, depending on the mutation and depending on how it acts and depending on which breed you're finding it in, it may act differently and, and all of that sort of thing. So it's a lot of uh, nuance. Uh, to keep track of. That, I think, is where a lot of information can kind of get confused or lost uh, in translation. I don't entirely fault the veterinarians by any stretch. This is not a, an easy concept, and it's something I still have to sit down sometimes and think about really hard because there's so much going on, but it is, it is fascinating. Uh, having kind of been a little bit removed from the genetic side of things for the last few years since I've been focusing more on scientific communications and corporate affairs, I went back and read a genetics article a few months ago to present, and I was like, oh my God, this is my happy place. <laughs> like, all right, all right, this is where I, I want to be. Um, so I am excited to be dipping my toes more back into that side of things and, and how to educate uh, folks around genetics in, in practice and, and such, because I do think it's fascinating. I do think it can be helpful. Right now, I'm focusing on developing um, a lecture around the evolution and domestication of dogs and why they aren't, they aren't little wolves. You know, they are 15 plus thousand years removed from wolves. They uh, likely ate many of the same things, if not the exact same things as the humans that they developed alongside. Uh, so we kind of co-evolved with dogs, uh, which makes sense. And that's why, you know, we both share, you know, similar changes in our ability to digest starches and all of that sort of thing, which you could probably speak way more to than I can, but also just the aspects of the human animal bond and how we share somewhat a language with them more so than we do probably any other species, because it is the one species that has literally co-evolved with us. Uh, and so they can read us. We can, you know, tend to read them better than, than just about any other animal. So anyway, I just think it's a fascinating area and a fascinating topic, and we are learning more and more every day. So there's going to be more fun things to talk about soon. Oh, always in this profession. I think it's a profession where you can thrive if you are a learner and like yes. to con constantly be learning along the way. And I like how you are intertwining two 
kind of interest of the human animal bond in genetics. And I was looking in your, your work history, and these are both topics that you have had some a part of uh, throughout your, your career. So I love how you show that the human animal bond has been around since it, the beginning almost, right? And we have evolved together. So I think that's a really special part of genetics and a way of looking at it. You also started talking about the nuances and some limitations with genetics and these tests. I, I love that we do have some companies who are focused on that, you know, bringing the importance of genetics and what we can do all as veterinarians with that information. However, there are times when we aren't quite sure what to believe or not. Similarly, in nutrition, you probably hear a lot of different things. And how does a veterinarian who isn't a geneticist, how do we know what to believe? What can we use to help our patients? That's a, an awesome question. I think it comes down to looking at where you're getting your information from. For better or worse, there's only a small handful of genetic companies that have, you know, kind of survived. There were a number, you know, over the, the last probably 15, 15 plus years that have tried to enter the uh, consumer, you know, in veterinary spaces, but there are a, a small number that have, you know, really survived and, and done well. Those are generally um, reputable companies, uh, but if you have any questions, call them, reach out and ask them. They should have veterinarians on staff that can answer your questions uh, and help you interpret the data and uh, make decisions from it and share with you the limitations. You know, what, what does this tell you and what doesn't it tell you, which can be equally important. That would be my recommendation is if you don't know, don't make rash decisions based on it. Don't, don't euthanize an animal just because they came up positive for a mutation for DM. Um, that is not an appropriate you know, response to that result. Uh, you should call and, and get some genetic counseling. And the best places to get that right now would be from the companies themselves or from the veterinary geneticists that would be on staff at veterinary schools. So there are several around the country. Purdue employs a veterinary geneticist. Um, Minnesota has a couple of them. Davis, UC Davis has several. Tufts used to, pandas, you know, there's there's a, a number of veterinary schools around the country that have veterinary geneticists. Unfortunately, it's not as prevalent as I would like. I was hoping by, you know, back in, in 2007, 2008, when I was finishing up my PhD and looking at my, you know, my path forward, I honestly thought I would be a, a veterinary geneticist teaching veterinary students in academia. But the recession hit and uh, this job opportunity came up at Mars and uh, it was doing honestly technical support. And at first I was like, I don't want to do technical support. And then I was like, wait a minute, it's essentially teaching, except I don't have to grade them. I'm talking about their own dog. So hopefully they'll be interested and engaged in the information I have to share with them. And, you know, I can do this for a couple of years and then I can go back into academia when, you know, when the recession kind of settles down and, and vet schools start hiring again. Well, little did I know at the time, veterinary schools were going to be put, you know, get really squeezed by the, by the recession. And now quite honestly, I feel like they're worried in trying to keep their internal medicine specialists and their surgeons and all of those sorts of things. So oftentimes they aren't really thinking about some of these subspecialties like genetics. I haven't really seen the opportunity to go back to academia, even if I wanted to. I've been thrilled with the path I've gone down. I've gotten to do all sorts of really great things uh, and go all over the world. Quite honestly, I've spoken in Japan. I've spoken in Europe, created a test that could honestly change the dynamic of how dogs are bred in the future, which is a little bit mind boggling to me. So I don't uh, begrudge by any means where I moved to in terms of my career and I'm really thankful for it, but it's not where I anticipated going originally. So that's the other thing I would say is, is be open, be ready for whatever comes your way because you don't know when it's going to come and you need to be ready to grab it and, and go with it because it could be quite honestly life-changing and, and could be better than what you had originally planned out in your mind anyway. Absolutely. And I, I think we are at a time where the opportunities are almost endless 
with where you can go with your interest. So let's inspire some people to, to love genetics. What are some things that you see if someone did want to pursue a, a career in genetics, what could some career paths look like? So looking at, you know, what's open out there, you know, I mean, I can give you my take on it and what I've been exposed to, but that said, there's, there's probably a number of opportunities that I don't even know about, but within Wisdom Health, you know, the original job description for the job I took was a veterinarian who had some background in genetics. And I was like, well, yeah, I kind of have that. But moving forward, I had to, you know, there aren't many people like me that, you know, had a more a veterinarian and had a background in genetics. So when I had to build the technical support team out beyond myself, they asked me, they were like, do you want geneticists or do you want veterinarians? Because we're not going to find veterinary geneticists uh, very readily. And I always said, I want a veterinarian. I can teach them the genetics. I can't teach them veterinary medicine, you know? Uh, and so quite honestly, we hired and granted, the first one that we hired uh, had a master's that involved genetics, so she had some background. But beyond that, we hired one, two, three, four, five, something like five different veterinarians that just had an interest, a willingness to learn, and wanted to move into a corporate type role. And two, all of them but two are still working there. <laughs> One moved on to uh, uh, take another role at a, actually at an educational facility. She's uh, in academia. And then one of them has moved on to another genetics company. I think we did a pretty darn good job of A, identifying people uh, that, you know, could fill those buckets, but um, B, then also teaching them the genetics and taking that interest that they already had and just expanding upon it. Even if you don't have a degree in something, be it genetics or nutrition or, or what have you, pharmacology, you know, there's, there's all of these uh, roles in industry that you could explore and do a lot of, you know, as you said, we are veterinarians generally are very good learners. So you can do a lot of it on the job and learn as you go because it's, it's, it's honestly not rocket science. <laughs> it's, you know, the, any, any good company is going to give you at least some ground or, or information and hopefully provide you with people to go and ask questions of if you, you know, get stuck. That's really, I think the key is just go in and find areas that interest you and start exploring them. Yes. And I know how passionate you are about it. When at, we first met, you were onboarding at Royal Canaan and I was helping with the onboarding. I was so excited. I was supposed to be the teacher and I always learned things. I, that was a neat part about my role, but you taught us so much and you could just tell how excited you are about it. And I think that's a good sign. And you mentioned a, a story example earlier that after all this time, you read one journal article about it. And it, you got, I guess it, uh, I'll describe it for you. Maybe like this tingly inside that's like, oh yes. yeah, that's the so one <laughs> Yes. And, and that's such a good sign for potential other opportunities with genetics. Is there some opportunity to maybe marry them a little bit with the, the repro side of veterinary medicine? Do you see any type of collaboration? Do you have any ideas of how that might look? Uh, yeah, and I think that's, you know, I, I truly think the breeder space is one of the places we can really excel because quite honestly, these are the folks that are hopefully invested in maintaining a healthy breed and improving their breed. I want to support them in any way we can to continue that mission because I personally really like having dogs in our lives and, and cats. Uh, we have a Devon Rex and, and then a Welsh Springer Spaniel and a... Russell Terrier, Australian cattle dog mix that I found on the streets of Portland. <laughs> so we have quite the group here. But that being said, I think that's really the place that genetics will play the biggest role. You know, it's it's really good to have that information on the individual level. You know, my mixed breed dog is predisposed to X, Y, Z. Therefore, I'm going to pay more attention and do ABC to intervene and, and try to delay or prevent that from, from developing. But where we can really, I think, make a huge impact is working with the breeding community to identify uh, which mutations they have and therefore, you know, don't not breed them. That's not appropriate, 
because every, every animal, humans included, have a number of health mutations. Uh, we just don't always know what those are. But if we can identify those, then we can help breeders do appropriate mate selection so that they can essentially prevent, maybe not in every case because you know stuff happens, but essentially prevent producing affected offspring, which is just amazing to me. You know, that's one of the benefits of breeding animals is that unlike in humans where, you know, you fall in love with your spouse and then you try to figure out the whole, you know, potentially having children thing in dogs and cats and, you know, horses and all of that sort of thing, we can identify who would be their, their best mate. Uh, and in most cases we can make that happen. Uh, it might require, you know, transcervical inseminations or, you know, some other intervention to, to mechanically make it happen but we can do that. We can ship semen around the world. So, you know, the idea of showing up at the breeder and being able to see both parents, I generally see that as a bad sign. They bred to the animal that was convenient, not necessarily the animal that was the best choice. That being said, you also have to, you know, kind of cross your T's and dot your I's when you're looking at, at a, a mate that's halfway around the world. It does bring in different challenges and things to think about. But really, the, you know, the opportunities are almost endless. We almost have too much information in many cases. And so that's the other side of things is how do we help breeders whittle these decisions down and make them approachable? Uh, my philosophy was always uh, show us which males you're interested in breeding to because they tick all of your boxes. And then I will help you make that final decision by looking at the genetic diversity on top of that. There's other approaches. One is, you know, just kind of like throwing your dog into the pool and saying, okay, which would be the best possible match? But I also want to incorporate, you know, confirmation analysis and temperament analysis and other family history and, and all of that sort of thing. So I like doing the, you know, kind of doing all of that analysis first and then adding the, the genetic diversity kind of as one of the last pieces uh, once you know, you know, the two or three males that you would be willing to breed your female to. So there are two different, you know, there are different approaches to it. But yes, I think there is a ton of potential uh, to really help breeders identify good mate uh, matches and to produce healthier offspring as a result. I love the idea of range marriages for <laughs> cats and dogs. So before I, I leave this, where could a veterinarian go to, if a breeder came to them and wanted to know the, the best mate for their dog or do the arranged marriage, where is this information? Where would a veterinarian send a breeder to find an expert or a stud book or where do they go? To be honest with you, the breeder would probably be the most equipped to do it uh, themselves through, you know, there's a lot of resources within the, the breeder community for looking at pedigrees and pedigree analysis and coefficients of inbreeding and that sort of thing. The issue with a coefficient of inbreeding is it's somewhat limited because it is based on pedigree information and, you know, how far do you go back in that pedigree? And it's an average for the litter that that dog came out of and, and all of that sort of thing. So that would be, you know, it's, it's a good tool, but it's not the best tool. I do think that genetic analysis is better than coefficient or COI, a coefficient of inbreeding. That said, uh, there's only a couple of, of places that you can get a genetic coefficient of inbreeding in terms of genetic diversity, you know, the optimal selection test or my, my dog DNA, my cat DNA, all under the, the wisdom health um, uh, group is going to provide uh, a lot of that information. Uh, Embark also, I believe, does it as well. And those are quite honestly, I think the two that do. What is the percentage of purebred dogs? In the U.S., it's uh, roughly 50, 50, 50 purebred, 50 mixed. It's, you know, kind of wavers between those, uh, maybe a little bit under 50% now that doodles are so popular. Um, uh, they are technically mixed breed dogs. Um, and you know, they have advantages and they have disadvantages. Uh, so it's, it depends on, on what the family is looking for and, and the dog that they want probably right around 50%. Cats, it's different. It's more like 5% uh, pedigreed cats and 95%, you know, mixed breed cats. How do you answer the question of what is healthier, a purebred or a mixed breed dog? Um, so I've had two mixed breed dogs and so far one purebred dog in my lifetime. Uh, and quite honestly, 
again, knock on wood, hopefully my purebred stays healthy. Um, she has been healthier than my mixed breeds. <laughs> my concern with the mixed breeds is that you don't know what you're going to be facing. It's, it's a bit of a crapshoot. Um, my first dog, Rimsky, who was, you know, lovely in many respects, ended up being, you know, found out when he was nine, he was not an overgrown papillon like I thought. He was in fact a Cocker Spaniel Maltese and a lot of other stuff mix. And he ended up with epilepsy. So he had seizures starting at about four or five years of age. I didn't put two and two together until I got his DNA results back that he was a Cocker Spaniel mix. I'm like, ah, Cocker Spaniels get epilepsy. So that may be where he got it from. I don't know. It may have been, you know, from a, you know, just general source. And then my uh, Russell Terrier Australian cattle dog mix uh, has uh, atopy. So both of those dogs have had, you know, daily medication for their lives. To be fair, Rimsky, my first pup, uh, made it to 17 and lived, you know, a long, healthy life on very low dose phenobarb. So that was, that was lovely. Um, and he's still, you know, the love of my life. And then Annie is now uh, just over nine, but yeah, she's, uh, she's got out of peace. So, so that, you know, mixed breed dogs, they can be healthier and they can also still have issues and, and health problems. So, you know, I don't know that there's a clear cut answer. Now on the purebred side, they are a smaller gene pool and therefore have a higher risk of, of an inherited health condition um, from that uh, respect. But usually it's, you know, from a, a somewhat shorter list of differentials, uh, you kind of know what to look for given the breed. They can still get weird kooky stuff too, but it's just a little bit of a, a different angle. So what I always advised veterinarians um, to think about was kind of, again, like with the Rimsky example, look at what are the breeds in the mixed breed dog, if you know what they are, and think about what are the differentials that might come to mind based on that breed composition. Uh, in Rimsky's case, you know, epilepsy, when he first had a seizure and we were like, is it an you know, infection in his brain? Is it, you know, cancer? Is it, you know, one of these other things? And then it turned out he, you know, just occasionally had a seizure and, and did fine otherwise, you know, with medication. Uh, we finally kind of backed into the, the seizure and epilepsy uh, uh, diagnosis. But had I known at the time that he was a Cocker Spaniel mix, maybe that would have been a little bit higher on my, on my radar. So that's kind of how I recommend that people uh, use that information. And now with uh, direct DNA testing, the Wisdom Health team did, we published uh, several years ago, looking at over 100,000 dogs, and they have such a massive database now. We can really do some great studies looking at frequency of mutations and such like that. Uh, but based on that study, we found that mixed breed dogs were more likely to have one copy of a genetic health uh, mutation. That said, most disorders, not all, but most require two copies to affect the dog. So mixed breed dogs, you know, because there's these random assortment of breeds and therefore passing down whatever disease genes each of them has is more likely to have a copy of a mutation and sometimes copies of many different mutations, but less likely to carry two copies. Purebreds were more likely to carry two copies and therefore to be affected, which makes sense based on the breed structure or the genetic structure of the population. Yes. Okay. So basically it depends. Research your breed. <laughs> yep. Research your breed. Research your breeder. People can go to the Canine Health Information Center, I want to say is what it's called, CHIC, C-H-I-C. And I believe it's hosted by the Orthopedic Foundation or uh, for Animals or OFA. Uh, and they can look up a purebred, you know, breed. And most breeds are going to be represented there. And it will give you the list of tests that is expected by the breed club to be performed prior to breeding that animal, that dog. For instance, you know, you pull up Labrador Retriever, you know, the Labrador Retriever Club has recommended that the dog get their hips evaluated, their elbows evaluated, their eyes evaluated, perhaps do certain genetic testing for like PRA, progressive retinal atrophy, their heart evaluated, whatever it is, that is the list that I would then go to the breeder and say, have you done these tests? And what are the results? And what are the results on the sire? And make sure that A, they know that those tests are required or, or should be done, and B, that they have performed them, and C, then what are the results and get that information back so that you can, you know, make an educated decision about whether to pursue a puppy or a kitten from that, from that breeder. Cats, it's a little bit less 
defined. They don't have quite the same level of organization there. Although, like I said, I've been very impressed with a lot of the cat breeders being very proactive in terms of wanting to understand the health and the genetics of their, of their breeding animals. So uh, hopefully you will find a good breeder that has done those, those activities. And if you're a veterinarian, if you have a breeder come into you who wants to breed their animal, you can go to that website, you can download that information and be like, this is what you need to do in order to, you know, get the stamp of approval from your, your breed club. It's not required, but that is what the club has said they would recommend for breeding animals. And if you do all of those things, then you get a special what's called chick number or chick certification. It doesn't matter what the results are. You can have, you know, a dog with horrible hips, but if you did all of the testing, you still get the chick stamp you you did the did all the testing now what you do with that information is up to you but but that said and then as a veterinarian it's not you telling the breeder what they should do it's their breed club yeah so with all your experience so far your your love of teaching uh, being able to see different things in veterinary medicine from different perspectives what would you give as words of wisdom to our colleagues and the profession give yourself some grace. You know, we can only do so much. We tend to be high, you know, high achievers, type A personalities and, you know, go, go, go. Uh, My husband, you know, kind of laughs at me because I don't sit still very well. We also need to remember to take time for ourselves and give ourselves a break. And, you know, sometimes, you know, I have to remind myself, I have multiple lists in various places in my house, on my phone, on a whiteboard, on paper, you know, I have to sometimes be like, you know what, I just need to sit down tonight and, you know, take it and take a chill pill and, and relax and it will all be there tomorrow. We can only do so much. I think this is an amazing profession where we have the ability to impact so many others we have the ability to impact them in, in many different ways. So obviously clinical practice is hugely important and we really appreciate the veterinarians and the veterinary staffs that are out there um, working very hard in, in practice uh, to help patients on a day-to-day basis. But there are also opportunities within industry or academia or, or elsewhere where you can still have significant influence on pets and pets' lives and making a better world for pets doing it, but but a little bit more removed. I like to keep that in mind too. In my years at uh, Wisdom Health, I probably talked to something like mm, 10,000 owners, pet owners, maybe more. And I personally looked at the results, the genetic results of over 100,000 animals. That's just a little bit mind boggling. There are lots of avenues. It's good to explore what your options are and and to realize that you're not limited to any one kind of trajectory. I'm exploring communications now. I've gone into uh, getting a master's in communications uh, through the University of Florida actually has a great online program through their College of Journalism. It's been good and difficult all at the same time. You know, it takes me out of my, my comfort zone and my, you know, my safe place, but it is also really helpful to learn how to best communicate to an audience, depending on what it is you're trying to accomplish and think about who your audience is and put yourself in their shoes. You know, your message is only as good as it, as it is received. Um, So we have to make sure that it's received by the audience we're aiming at, even if their position or their values do not necessarily align with ours. So we might think this is the most amazing argument or message to give to persuade them. I'm, I'm looking at persuading uh, people to do something to improve their health or their life, you know, that sort of thing, like stop smoking campaigns and things like that. Uh, again, in the vet, in the vet world, we're looking at how do you uh, convince pet owners that they want to do something to improve their pet's health. Uh, and that's kind of the angle I'm taking on it. But needless to say, it may not be the message that resonates best with you that's going to resonate with them. So you really have to think about it uh, a bit from their perspective and figure out what message resonates best with them, even if it's not the one you want to give, if it's the one that's received and therefore makes the change you're aiming for, that's what we need to think about. I find persuasive communication fascinating. I love reading books about it, you know, why people think certain ways, how they think. 
And it is important skill, no matter where you are in life, mm -hmm. uh, veterinary or not. I'm glad that you are getting the opportunity to dive deeper into that, because I think that we need people to research that because that is really going to impact our profession as well and how we how we have better lives because we can communicate with the, the clients much better. Absolutely. And I feel like it it puts a little bit of a different bent on it and and reframes it so that I don't get so personally wrapped up in it. If you can kind of step back and look at it more professionally speaking why is it that this group of people thinks this and uh, what is resonating with them? I really noticed it with the um, 2020 election uh, because I could, I could step back and I could look at both sides and think about what their, their own individual values are and why certain messages would resonate with them. And it took a lot of the emotion out of it for me, uh, which was really helpful for my own mental state and all of that sort of thing but also thinking about it in terms of how we approach our, our clients. And with burnout being such an issue and our emotional investment in our patients and in our clients, I think if we can do our best to step back a little bit and, and evaluate it a little bit more from that perspective of, you know, what all are they dealing with? And, and they might not be able to do exactly what I want them to do for the, the health of the pet because they have all of these other issues and aspects in their lives. Uh, so what can we, you know, agree to as, you know, a, a happy medium <laughs> as best we can and all walk away better? Yeah, you know, we might not walk away the best we could be, but we can walk away better. Well, do you have a couple minutes for our final rapid fire questions? Sure. The first one is what is something on your bucket list? Breeding, breeding uh, my dog. Hopefully she passes all of her health tests and all of that sort of thing. It's been something I've been thinking about for, you know, roughly a decade now. I like spaniels. I realized that was the traits within Rimsky that I just adored were his spaniel traits. And I'm like, okay, I want a spaniel, but a Brittany's a little too much. So happened to chat with somebody at a conference who said, you know what, you should check out the Welsh Springer Spaniel. So I looked into them, I thought about it for several years, researched it, and then finally reached out to a breeder and was like, hey, I'm not your normal puppy buyer. I am a veterinarian. I'm a geneticist. I want to go into breeding. I would, you know, realize that I'm asking to get a very specific type of dog and I'm looking to, you know, build a relationship because I know it's going to be a few years before, you know, just the right dog comes along and it's now the pandemic. I'm not traveling. I can, you know, deal with a puppy. Well, it turns out her dog was pregnant and she had one puppy and it turned out it was a female uh, and that she had all of the, you know, characteristics we needed. She was show quality and all of these things. So, so it turned out I ended up getting a puppy during the pandemic. So I, I got to move down that, that uh, road and hopefully in a year or a year and a half, we will have our first litter. So we'll see. All right. Second question. What is a moment of simple joy for you? I appreciate that, that emotional support animals exist and that they, you know, belong to other people and help people and that sort of thing. Um, but it was really the pandemic and realizing how much I rely on Nori uh, to, to be my emotional support animal. I had to send her with her handler a couple of times for dog shows uh, that were further away that I couldn't go to myself. And it was, it was crazy how much it impacted me to have her out of our space. I definitely, when I need a moment to just breathe and, and have a, a happy, positive experience, I generally go to her, to her or to my son, although he's now seven and he sometimes allows me to come and cuddle him and sometimes doesn't. <laughs> That, that's a good point. Real, just real quickly to add on, you know, with the pandemic, we talked about the, our dogs getting used to us being around, but I think it's vice versa. We got yeah. used to being, having our pets around us all the time. So I think there's some attachment issues on both sides. <laughs> oh, dependency. I, you know, yes. Yeah, exactly. All right. Third question is, if you could create a law that everyone had to follow, what would your law be? Probably provide food, food to everybody. Because I think malnutrition and all that sort of thing is, is tough for humans, pets, everybody. Um, and if we can take that one stressor out, uh, I think that would be huge. Everybody gets to eat, animals, humans, otherwise. Good answer. I like that. 
Finally, what is one thing that you are most grateful for? I am most grateful for my family. I couldn't have done all that I have done without my family. You know, my husband uh, is incredibly supportive and as much as, you know, he might grumble sometimes when I travel a lot for work uh, and he has to hold down the homestead, I have told him repeatedly that I could not do what I do without him. And, you know, certainly my son, who we tried for several years to have, and so finally we're blessed with him and my pets. This has been the Vet Life Reimagined podcast. Whether you are listening or watching on YouTube, I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Please make sure you are subscribed to catch all these amazing people in our profession. Also, send this episode to someone you think who would appreciate it. Have a recommendation for someone who would be a good guest? Please reach out on LinkedIn, Instagram, or Facebook. There aren't that many Dr. Sprinkles. Until next time, Vet Lifers.